it is important to emphasise the incredible amount of manuscripts we have regarding the Bible that date so close to the original text. It gives us confidence that, that the Bible we have is, is true and um, that it can be validated. But it's easy to believe that, yes, maybe what we have is, is true uh, or is, is accurate as to what was originally written, but is what it contains accurate according to history? So what we're going to do now is just have a look at some of the archaeology discoveries which have been made, um, which help to identify that the different stories throughout the Bible were in fact true because there are, there are other cities or things which exist to, to time point them. Now, one of my favourite examples is the one of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, in Daniel 5 verse 1, he's mentioned. And up until 1850s, there was no mention of Belshazzar. And historians generally rejected uh, the account of Daniel and lots of the different uh, the people and uh, places which are mentioned. Um, but in 1853, um, archaeologists discovered full, four small clay cylinders at Ur in Mesopotamia, inscribed with the accounts of the rebuilding of Ur's ziggurat by King Nabonidus, who historians up to 1850 believed was the, the last king of uh, Babylon. So these inscriptions on the cylinder concluded with prayers of health of Nabonidus and for his eldest son and co-regent Belshazzar. Now this was the first of many different texts which helped to prove that Belshazzar existed, which added further proof to the accuracy of Daniel. It time stamped it to a, a time which proved that what Daniel was saying was correct. Another example is the Hittites, who uh, were once regarded as a scriptural inaccuracy or a scribal error, as there was no other record or artefact which proved their existence. It was only the Bible. And once again, this changed in the age of discovery in archaeology in the 1870s in Carchemish on the Euphrates River in Syria, where these Hittite monuments were discovered. And then again in 1906, when excavations began at a place I can't pronounce, Boghazkvi or something like that, in Turkey, um, where they uncovered thousands of Hittite documents, just proving that the Hittites actually did exist and that the Bible hadn't created this, this nation. Uh, another great example is the Moabite stone, or the Misha still. And this stone, which now resides in the Louvre, was found in Jordan and records statements of King Misha of Moab, who brags of having driven the Israelites out of his land. And this perfectly aligns with what we've got in 2 Kings chapter 3, where the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel after the death of Ahab. And the Moabite stone is unique in the fact that it mentions the name of God, Yahweh. So not only do we have the Bible, which up until this point had been the only use of the word, of the name of God, Yahweh, we now have a, a Moabite stone which contains the name of God. Uh, another example is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser, which is a two-metre tall black four-sided pillar an obelisk, which can be found in the British Museum and shows narrated images of the conquests of the Assyrian king Shalmaneser. Now, one of the images uh, on the obelisk show Jehu, the king of Israel, and specifically name him, uh, names him and his reign, which is in 2 Kings 9-10. to There are so many examples of archaeology which help to prove that the Bible... Uh, that time does not allow me to delve into. But some interesting ones, um, which we haven't gone into, is Hezekiah's Tunnel and the inscription, the Sennacherib Prison, the Cyrus Cylinder, the excavation of Giza. Uh, a really interesting one is the mud bricks in Egypt, um, especially in the cities of Python and Ramses, where uh, up to a certain point, the bricks were all made of one material, but then, as the Exodus record talks about with Pharaoh changing that the Israelites had to go gather their own straw, the amount of straw in the bricks significantly decreases above a certain point at the right time period. 
Um, anyway, but the Nebuchadnezzar Chronicle, uh, the Pilate inscription, uh, which talks about Pilate, the Temple Mount, and, the, and there's just so many more uh, places and things which uh, help to validate the accuracy of the Bible. So hopefully so far we've established that the Bible we have today is in fact an accurate translation of the original copies and writings so long ago and that the information that it contains can be accurately verified and time-stamped to, to places and things throughout history. So I think... Sorry, I got indigestion. I think now is a good time to investigate a comment we made earlier um, this evening that the Bible itself was written by around 40 authors writing different sections over 1,500 years on three continents in three different languages. Now, up to this point, we haven't really talked about God and his role in the Bible. We've really only looked at physical things outside of the Bible, which help to prove it. But from now on, for the rest of the evening, the proofs we are going to look at will make more sense when we consider that the Bible was ultimately written by God. So, if, ever, if you would, uh, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, and verses uh, 20 and 21, where it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, or more appropriately uh, translated, origin. <laughs> For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved or, or driven by the Holy Spirit. So here, quite clearly, Peter states that the writings of the Bible were written by men through the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning that the words we read, while they're written by men, are ultimately the words of God. And another example of this is in 2 Timothy 3... Oops, I've even written the wrong quote on the slide. Um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, it says... Uh, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God or under the inspiration of God. There is nothing in the Bible that has not come from God. It is his word. And when we begin to actually look at the Bible, this makes a lot of sense because the complexity and the interwovenness, if that's a word, of the Bible is, is mind-blowing. Um, so with this in mind, we're going to have a look at a few images which I find quite fascinating. And this, we, we call this like an internal proof, just of, of the words and themes of the Bible itself. So the image we have on the slide there is a, a visual representation of the times the Bible quotes itself. Um, along the bottom, it changes between dark grey and light grey, which you probably can't see, but that represents the different books of the Bible, and then the, the lengths of the stems represent each individual chapter. But that's the irrelevant part. The important part is the arcs which go above the graph. They represent every time the Bible quotes itself, either thematically or a direct, direct citation. And the colour of the arc, um, I believe, is just the length or, or the, the time or distance between the, the chapters. This is just quite incredible. For me, this is one of the most incredible proofs of the Bible. Just thousands and thousands of times the Bible quotes and refers to itself. It's almost a work of art, the amount that the Bible is interconnected. It would be impossible for, for any human or even a group of humans to compose a collection of books which tells a seamless, continuous story, yet is so interrelated and consistent that they could produce an image like this. And what's even more incredible is that we established that the Bible was written by 40 or so authors on, on three different continents, in three different languages, over 1,500 years. You couldn't get two people in the same room to write something completely independently of each other and for it to be so connected, let alone 40 people on three different continents in different languages. Clearly, you can see the hand of God working, working here. Uh, the second image is a good one as well. This might be a little bit more difficult to uh, see, but it comes from a really good uh, interactive website where you can, up, up the top, uh, all the books of the Bible, and then down the side, 
are all the books of the Bible. And then down the side is your target search. So if you want to go to Isaiah, you go down the side to Isaiah, and then you go across the row, and you can click on any one of the squares, and it will take you to that book, and it will compare all of the cross-references between them. It's pretty much like the centre margin on a table, but it's really good. The image doesn't really do it justice. Um, but it, it just, once again, shows that the Bible is so interconnected and refers to itself so much. It's a great website if you're trying to find connections between different verses and chapters. So hopefully this is established that this indeed has to be inspired. It has to be inspired by God as it is so connected and flawless. It creates a, a beauty which can only be found through something divine. Now, Another proof that I find fascinating, this one focusing more on how God has to be the author because of the claims and the, the complex statements and scientific facts that are made in the Bible, um, which couldn't have been made by like a, a simple farmer or a shepherd. Um, one of the greatest examples of this is the law of Moses. Now, a well-respected doctor called uh, Dr. William R. Weiss, is a member of the American Medical Association and College of Physicians, stated, Moses rises above all other biblical characters because of his stupendous knowledge of public health and hygiene. The safeguarding of the people of Israel under the difficulties encountered should perhaps rank as the greatest achievement in all medical history. Now, we understand that it wasn't Moses' own words in the law of Moses. It was indeed God who gave uh, the law to Moses. But the, the point stands the same. Um, the, the level of intelligence in the law of Moses in regards to public health is far above anything which is still being discovered these days. And uh, Dr. Weiss uses leprosy as an example of the insight into infectious diseases uh, in the ancient times, pointing out that the law of Moses uses techniques unknown to the medical profession until fairly recently. Um, leprosy spread throughout southern Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries, and it wasn't until they enacted the concept of quarantine and other aspects of the law that they started to see a lowering in the number of leprous people. Um, for example... Moses disinfected the patient's clothing, their bed, and even the house itself. The leper was required to wear a covering on the upper lips, or a mask. On the occasion, the priest had to go outside of the camp into a quarantine to examine the patient, further protecting the population. And this can all be found in Leviticus in, in extreme detail. And another example of, of the public health that the law had um, when, can be found when we look at this, the sanitary code of the Israelites, deals in massive detail with uh, public hygiene, water supply, sewage disposal, um, inspection and the selection of different foods, what they could and couldn't eat in controlling, in controlling disease. Another example of this is the importance of clean water. This is outlined in Leviticus 11, where Moses states what is safe water to drink, what is not, by where they've sourced it from. Now, this concept was only discovered... Um, in modern medicine in the late 1800s. As prior to that, people didn't understand that disease was spread through water. Um, diseases like typhoid and uh, cholera and many, many other diseases were spread by polluted water. And the list of incredible health-related laws goes on and on. The level and detail of, of health and infection control that is in the law could only come from someone who knows everything inside out obviously God. There were no other nations or civilizations throughout history who had quite as an advanced health system. Clearly God had to be telling Moses these laws. It's only now that because of science we are slowly catching up to the law of Moses. But the, the wonders of science in the Bible don't end at public health. The Bible lays out numerous scientific facts that once again have only been discovered in recent times. Now, we can't go into every science and health fact in the Bible as much as I'd love to, but I've just chosen a few scientific facts which I find quite interesting. The first being that the Earth is suspended in space by nothing. 
It's free, it floats, and is in fact a globe being round. It wasn't until the mid-17th century that scientists began to discover that the Earth was free-floating, and then our planet is a globe and not flat, and doesn't ride on the back of an elephant, as much older superstition said. But the Bible, in Job 26, verse 7, says, He stretches out the north over the empty space. He hangs the earth upon nothing. It quite clearly states in Job that the earth just sits in space. It's not hung by a string. And Isaiah, in Isaiah 40, verse 22, says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. We can quite clearly see that far before human scientists discovered that the earth is round, God, who is throned in heaven, could clearly see that his creation is is round. He created it, obviously he sees it. But yes, anyway. Another great science concept or fact um, is the water cycle. Job says in Job uh, 26 verse 8 that he, God, wraps up the waters in his clouds. Yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. And then in in Job 36, verse 27 and 28, he draws up the drops of water, which distill as rain to the streams. The clouds pour down their moisture, and abundant showers fall upon mankind. This is such a detailed explanation of the water cycle, which was not uh, understood by scientists till around the 1670s, when two French scientists discovered it. How would have Job known this? Well, he wouldn't have without the divine power of God. These facts and these these aspects of the Bible just further validate that it has to have been written and inspired by God. It can't have just been men that wrote these. So a quick recap of where we're at so far. So we've established that the Bible we have today is in fact an accurate translation of the original copies and writings written so long ago. The information contained can be verified with archaeological discoveries throughout history. The Bible is actually the Word of God. Uh, We have seen that the Bible is so interconnected and linked that contradictions are impossible. It would be impossible for for humans to write a, a compendium of books like this on their own. And that Uh, health and science facts in the Bible were so far ahead of their time that people are still only discovering what the Bible stated so many years ago. Now, all of these external and internal proofs show the power of the hand of God in the Bible. But one of the greatest, if not the greatest proof we have in the Bible, of the Bible, is, is broken into two parts. It's prophecy and the nation of Israel. There are many, many prophecies that have come to pass throughout history which only strengthen the the validity of the Bible. Some in such detail that scholars have said that the prophecy, or critics have said, that the prophecy must have been written after the fact. It's not really a prophecy at that point, it's just history. Um, But books like, uh, chapters like Daniel 11 and and many others. Um, So we're going to look now at two prophecies. The first being Ezekiel 26, and the second being Ezekiel 38, our reading tonight. So the first one, Ezekiel 26, is the prophecy of Tyre. So if you turn with me there, we're just going to read a few verses from here. Starting at verse 1. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Because that Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken, that was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me, I shall be replenished, now she is laid waste. So originally this this city, almost little nation of of Tyre and Israel had a really good relationship. They had been trading partners in in the times of David and Solomon, especially when the temple was being built. But Amos 1, verse 9 and 10, go into the detail that Tyre had not remembered the the covenant, the brotherly covenant that Israel and Tyre had had when Israel went into captivity. Tyre realised, as verse 2 says, that it was only going to be beneficial for Tyre if Israel went into captivity. So Ezekiel carries on in verse 3 saying, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, 
Behold, I am against thee, Tyre, and will cause many nations to come against thee. As the sea causes his waves to come up, they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall come and it shall become a spoil to the nations. And this is exactly as it happened. Many nations did come against Tyre, but the, the detail of the invasion is remarkable. So here it says that the walls shall be destroyed and broken down. But in verse 7, we get far more detail. It goes on by saying that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, will come down with his chariots and horsemen and many people slaying what's called the daughters in the field or the, the smaller surrounding cities uh, in Phoenicia. And continuing from verse 9, he, or Babylon, shall set engines of war against your walls and with axes he shall break down your towers. Now, this happened exactly as Ezekiel prophesies here. Uh, this image shows Tyre, and uh, there's two parts of Tyre. There's the outcrop island of Tyre, and then there's the mainland city of Tyre. Just ignore, for the moment, the seven to 800 metre dam in the middle. We'll get to that. But in the, in the context of where we're at in the story, the Babylonians came down and sieged and destroyed old Tyre, or the, the mainland section of Tyre. And they came down with their siege weapons and then they uh, the, destroyed the mainland city and then they set siege to the island for, for around 13 years before they eventually uh, <coughs> subjugated the rule of uh, the island subjugated to the rule of Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar put his own like puppet ruler in, in play there. But as earlier on in Ezekiel said, there'd be waves. It would not just be one invasion, it would be several. And uh, verse 12 to 14 of Ezekiel 26 goes on to say, And they shall make a spoil of your riches, and make a prey of your merchandise. They shall break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. And they shall lay your stones and your timber and your dust in the midst of the water. And years later, Alexander the Great and his empire came against the city area of Tyre. After destroying what was left of the mainland city, breaking down the walls and destroying the houses, Alexander, in a feat of remarkable determination and warfare, created a, a causeway or a dam between the island of Tyre and the mainland of Israel by throwing all of the rubble from the mainland city into the ocean until it eventually breached the gap and they reached the city of Tyre. Such a unique way of, of, of capturing, capturing the city, and it's such a... You would not be able to think that anyone could foresee this. But God, through the prophet Ezekiel, prophesied this destiny of Tyre. And if that doesn't give you some form of wonder of the Bible, I'm not sure what will, because for someone to be able to prophesy that you're going to destroy a city and throw the remains of the city into the water, then walk across those remains into the, uh, on, and then capture the rest of the city, it's just quite incredible. God outlined that the city of Tyre would be first overcome and ruled by Babylon before being destroyed by Alexander the Great in the most unique and inconceivable way possible. And it's these little details that God gives us in the lasting impact it has on history. The fact that the, the small dam that Alexander the Great created has now turned into a peninsula that it's just part of the mainland now. So that little outcrop is what was the island of Tyre and it's just merged now into the mainland of Israel. This just has to give us some form of confidence that God is indeed in control and that what he's said in the Bible will come, will come to pass. Now, he said we're going to look at two prophecies, and the second one is, is far more incredible and miraculous than the first. Far more inconceivable and incredible than the prophecy of Tyre, the regathering of Israel. But before we look at the prophecy about the nation of Israel, it's worth noting some things about Israel. The first being that God quite clearly states that the nation of Israel is his people, that they are a witness to his name and his words being true. And this is the ultimate proof of the word of God, the nation of Israel. 
Uh, come with me to Jeremiah 31 and verse uh, 35 to 37. It says, Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances, or the sun, the moon, and the ocean, depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. What a great passage this is that God gives us. It so clearly outlines that when the sun and the moon and the ocean cease to exist in their natural way, or when man, as verse 37 says, can measure the heavens and know exactly what's under the ocean, when they can do that, Israel will stop being a nation. What a powerful statement this is by God. He is so sure of his promise to keep Israel a nation that he has said that the existence of the sun and the moon and the ocean are less sure than the nation of Israel being there. It's just, it's just inconceivable that God would, uh, that the nation of Israel will stop being existing. So with this in mind, we'll have a look at the prophecy from the reading we read tonight and a bit of the history of the nation of Israel. And it was prophesied all throughout the Bible that Israel would be scattered among the nations. One of these quotes is in Deuteronomy 28, verse 64 to 66, which I have got on the slide. And it says, And the Lord shall scatter you among all people, from one end of the earth to the other. And among these nations you will find no ease, uh, neither your feet have anywhere to rest, and your life shall hang in doubt before you, fearing day and night, having no assurance of your life. Now, isn't that a prophecy that's been fulfilled? Even looking at the occupation of the land from the times of the first captivity under Babylon, and around 580 BC, right through to the mid-20th century, the Jews have not had ownership of the land of Israel. It's always been under occupation of another ruler under the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, under Islamic rule, under the Crusaders, under the Ottoman Empire, right up until the British in 1917, they took the mandate of Palestine. Israel was properly scattered. They had no place to rest their feet, no assurance that they would be alive at the end of the day. But never did the nation of Israel disappear. They were always there. Never has there been a time where the Jews have completely ceased to exist, just as God said. Now, while the prophecies of the scattering of Israel are fascinating to look at, the prophecies of the regathering of Israel are far more compelling of proof of the legitimacy and accuracy of the Bible. So, uh, if we come back to Ezekiel 37, and we're reading from verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Ezekiel saw a large expanse, this massive valley, but the floor of the valley couldn't even be seen because it was so full of bones. They were all around, verse 2 says. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very, very dry. These bones were not only dead, they were dry. They had been dead for a very long time. Then uh, they were disgraced, they were denied a proper burial, scattered through a valley, heaped upon each other, left for the scavengers to feast on. These bones were not only dead, they were dry. They had been dead for such a long time. Then, in verse 3, God goes on to ask what would seem to be a simple question. Can these bones live? And to Ezekiel's credit, he doesn't deny the possibility that they, they could live, as impossible as it seems. He responds, O Lord God, you know. To which God responds in verse 4, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. We'll unpack this a little bit. God promised to fill the dry bones with breath. 
He promised to bring flesh upon them and cover them with skin. These, what once were dead bones, would live. This was a, this was a work of revival. It's restoring life to something that one, at one time had lived. This wasn't like the creation in the Garden of Eden where Adam was made from the dust. It was a restoration of something that had long been dead. The breath of life that can only come from God, his spirit, which is the only way we are alive today, would fill these bones. We'll keep reading in verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. If Ezekiel had any doubts, he put them away and did what God commanded. And as he was prophesying... There was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, then the sinews and flesh upon the bones, then the skin and tissue covering the flesh. The bodies just lacked, at this point, the breath of life, which can only come from God. Continuing verse 9, Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Now, there's some great lessons in these few verses, but without the rest of the chapter, we'd be at a loss as to what, what the meaning of this vision is. So, keep reading in verse 11 to 14. Um, it says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, and they cry out, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost. Prophesy and say to them, Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. It carries on. But this makes a bit more sense now. The valley full, as far as the eyes can see, of dead bones represents the whole nation of Israel. The significance of it being the whole nation is that at the time Ezekiel was writing, uh, Ezekiel was from the kingdom of uh, Judah, which was currently under captivity, but also the northern kingdom of Israel who had already fallen under captivity 150 years prior. So the whole kingdom, the whole house of Israel had good reason to cry with despair. They were all under captivity. Their only hope for life and restoration was through a miracle by God. Their bones were truly dry by the time when Israel was regathered and restored as a nation only in this last century. The key part of this section, though, is in the end of verse 12. I will bring you into the land of Israel. It wasn't going to be any other place. It had to be Israel. Now, the, the journey which Israel went to, to be rebirthed as a, new, as, as a nation again, was, is truly incredible. And we're going to go through a quick timeline, which just shows the remarkable events which had to all fit into place for Israel to become a nation again. So, 1882 was the first aliyah, or the first immigration of the Jews back to the land. And this occurred, and it brought about 25 to 35,000 immigrants back to Palestine. The majority of them were fleeing the anti-Jewish massacres and revolts in Eastern Europe called pogroms. The next event in 1894 was the Dreyfus Affair, where French Jewish army officer Alfred Dreyfus is wrongly convicted of espionage. And this case had a really galvanising effect on the development of the Zionist movement by emphasising the precariousness of Jewish life in Europe. Then, in 1896, uh, Basil Herzl, or sorry, Theodore Herzl, created the document called Judenstadt, which is the Jewish state. Theodore Herzl was an Austro-Hungarian uh, journalist who covered or uh, was the reporter for the Dreyfus trial. Um, and he publishes the book in which he proposes the creation of a Jewish state as the solution to anti-Semitism. So with so many of these pogroms happening across Europe that they decided, or uh, Theodore Herzl thought it would be a good idea to have Israel as its own state. Now this eventuated in uh, 1897 on August the 29th where they convened the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland. April 19, 1903, the Kishinev program, a pogrom, not program, this was in the Russian Empire at the time, um, in which was now Moldova, and it was one of the, the more uh, reported on uh, pogroms, and it killed dozens and dozens of Jews, and resulted in the destruction of hundreds of homes and businesses of, in the Jewish section of, of Russia at the time. 
This anti-Semitic movement grew across Europe, causing more and more Jews to flee to Palestine. April 11, 1909, the city of Tel Aviv was founded. This was the first modern Jewish city founded on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. 1910, the first modern Hebrew dictionary published by a gentleman called Eliezer ben Yehuda, which only increased the zeal of the Zionist movement, hastening the revival of the ancient language. People were getting more energised about the whole culture which the Jews had, had lost over time. November 2nd, 1917, probably one of the most significant uh, moments in modern Israeli history, was the Balfour Declaration. Uh, this was the first major political win for Zionism. This declaration, as I'm sure lots of you know, came in a letter uh, that uh, British Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour sent to Lord Rothschild on 2nd November 1917. The letter conveyed to the British Zionist Federation that the British government views with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and would use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. Pretty much, Britain supported the Jews having a home in Palestine. Well, October 30, 1918, World War I ends. And in the Middle East, uh, it ends, and then in the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire was broken up which had occupied Palestine since the 16th century. On June 1920, the Haganah is founded, which was the first independent defence force for the Jews in Palestine. July 24, 1922, the British Mandate of Palestine begins, which gained Britain the uh, permission to have authority over the territory of Palestine. 1929, the Fifth Aliyah begins, where over 200,000 Jews, mainly from Central and Eastern Europe, came to uh, Israel, or came to Palestine, um, just in the decade leading to World War II. This was, uh, most of the people were driven here by the, the thought of uh, the Nazi Germany was, was starting to become a, um, a, a power. In 1936, the Arabs form an organised revolt against the British rule, demanding their independence and the end of Jewish immigration, and this then led to the White Paper. Whoops, I've skipped one. The White Paper, uh, which was approved by the British House of Commons on May 23, 1939, which restricted immigration to Palestine at precisely the moment when Nazi Germany was making their rise to power. Now, I haven't even made it to the Second World War yet, and we can already see the fulfilment of Deuteronomy 28, where the Lord will scatter you among all people, among the nations you will find no ease. Your feet will have no place to rest. Wasn't this true? They were fleeing Europe. They came to Palestine. They got to Palestine. They weren't allowed in. Where did they go? They, they had no place to rest their feet. 1939 to 1945, or World War II, or the Holocaust, the greatest display of anti-Semitism ever shown, with over 6 million Jews dying over, over the six years. Then, in the post-war shock, on November 29, 1947... The UN votes to petition Palestine into two states, one Jewish and one Arab, as you can see on the screen. The Zionist leaders agreed to the plan, but the leaders of the Arab countries were not impressed, and they rejected it. And this led to a, a clash and a bit of a civil war. But a key moment of this war was in uh, December 1947, when the Arab siege of Jerusalem began. And this anger of the petition vote prompted rioting in Jerusalem, which uh, saw the death of many, many people. And the Arab siege of Jerusalem began uh, and it cut off about 100,000 or so Jewish residents in the city to the rest of the, the Israelites throughout the land. And here, the Arabs grabbed their part of Jerusalem back. Jerusalem is now split. May 14, 1948. Maybe some people here remember, maybe not. But David Ben-Gurion announced the establishment of Israel um, in a, uh, the state of Israel in a ceremony in Tel Aviv on the day that the British officially end their rule in Palestine. At this point, this is where Israel peaks. They have officially regathered. They are a nation again. This is the fulfilment of the prophecy. All of these events had to happen for Israel to become a nation again. But it wouldn't last long because the very next day they were invaded by the armies of five different Arab states, beginning the War of Independence. Now, the remarkable history of Israel continues. They were admitted to the UN. Uh, major immigration began. Um, 
only for Israel to enter into another miraculous war, the Six-Day War in 1967, where only by the hand of God, it's worth looking into, it's only by the hand of God, against all odds, Israel survives the invasion of five nations. And in this war, Israel gets their, their current land which they've got today. So they take back the rest of Jerusalem, they take back some of the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, uh, the Golan Heights, they take back a fair amount of Israel. Scholars and historians have, have no explanation. This, this was done against all odds. The only explanation is the one we find here in Ezekiel 37, where by God's spirit breath, the bones of Israel are gathered together and become a great and exceeding army. This is the ultimate show of the hand of God on display here. For me, this is the ultimate proof of the Bible. While there's manuscripts and archaeology, while the Bible is its own proof in its connectedness, while it speaks of facts of health and science, the prophecies of Tyre and all these other places, the many proofs we haven't even touched on, like creation and the, the human body which could only have ever been created. There's so many, but Israel is God's witness. Israel is the witness that God gives himself. They have never disappeared. They have remained in the land, a sure and certain witness. And if we believe this, how can we not believe the rest of the prophecy in Ezekiel 37? I won't uh, go through it now because it's quite, quite long, the section to read. But it pretty much says that uh, God will take the children of Israel from among the heathen in verse 21 and will gather them on every side and bring them into their land and they'll become a nation again. And verse 24, and David, or uh, more appropriately translated, my beloved, um, in this case it is Christ, will be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. They shall dwell in the land. And down to verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. These verses speak of a time where there will be unity around the world. There will be peace. Jesus will be ruling over the whole earth as a righteous king and we're invited to be there. If God's so accurately fulfilled the first half of this prophecy, why should we doubt that he'll fulfill the rest? This is our hope. This is what we live for. And it's what you could live for too. This, this kingdom where there will be peace and righteousness throughout the whole world forever. So the place I want to be and would love for you to be there with me. But we're told how to get there. And in, in Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, it says, All we need to do is believe the gospel, the things concerning this kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and be baptised. Tonight, I hope you've been able to see that the Bible is indeed accurate um, and truly the word of our God, and that it's this word we need to study and believe on, living it until Jesus returns in the near future. Thank you.